Lordsburg Catechism, Lord's Day 8. And there we confess the following. How are these articles, and then that's the 12 articles of our faith, the Apostles' Creed, how are these articles divided into three parts? The first is about God the Father in our creation, the second about God the Son in our redemption, the third about God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. Since there's only one God, why do you speak of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? because God has so revealed himself in his word that these three distinct persons are the one true eternal God. So far, our confession. Beloved people of God, brothers and sisters, including also boys and girls, I read somewhere that millennials are the first generation to actually grow up with social media. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and, and so on. And it's been said by psychologists that because of that, millennials are the generation most prone to perfectionism. Perfectionism. The social media in particular can make people think they have to be like influencers and, and the celebrities, otherwise their, their lives are not right, aren't worth much. It pushes people towards perfectionism. You see seemingly perfect people apparently leading perfect lives, and then an irrational desire to become perfect like them take, can take hold when you see that. And with perfectionism then is, I mean, an irrational desire for flawlessness. And that always comes combined also with harsh self-criticism. And it so easily develops into depression too because the perfection that's sought by people will always remain beyond reach, always. So many people struggle with perfectionism today. Also, church people, the desire for flawlessness combined with self-criticism and the chronic seeking of approval. It's of interest to, uh, to us today then that in the section of the letter to the Hebrews, which we read earlier on, the main issue is how can a person become perfect? That's actually something perfectionists are always busy with, right? In a way, our whole society is, is kind of perfectionistic always looking for a utopia. Not too long ago, there was a, an article in the Clarion about that. Always looking for a utopia, a kind of a perfect world. And a lot of people today think that perfection is possible through human intellect and ingenuity, a world without war, a world without crime, a world without climate change, a world without disease, even. But they're fooling themselves, aren't they? This is a broken world because of sin, and perfection, restoration, full salvation can only come from above, from God, from the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we confess him in Lord's Day 8. He is perfect, and only he can make perfect. And that's the comfort of our confession of the Holy Trinity too, right? That our salvation and perfection can only come and will come through the work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. Only the triune God can make sinners in a fallen world perfect. And you see that, for instance, in the passage we read from Hebrews 10, and 
I also want to add on to that Philippians 3. The, and the, our theme then is, the triune God brings us to perfection. God the Father wills that. God the Son accomplishes it, and God the Spirit finishes that. So the triune God brings us to perfection. God the Father wills that. So the Old Testament is quoted quite a lot in Hebrews 10. In the first 18 verses of Hebrews 10, for instance, Psalm 40 and Psalm 110 are quoted, and the writer used those quotes to show God's purpose, God's plan of salvation that's unfolding in time. The differences between the Old and the New Covenants are mentioned. You see, this book was written to Jewish Christians who were in danger of becoming estranged from the Christian faith, becoming too laid back and careless in their lives as Christians. And this letter reminds those Jewish Christians that in Old Testament times, God made his covenant with Israel. And in that old covenant, God had prescribed strict rules for worship, for sacrifices and ceremonies as found in the books of Exodus and Leviticus. Once a year, for instance, the day of atonement, the high priest had to make atonement for his own sins and then for the sins of the whole nation. He would, was only allowed into the Holy of Holies on that one day each year. And in that Holy of Holies, behind that big heavy curtain stood the golden ark containing the tables of the law with the angels both looking down on the mercy seat. And on that day of atonement, the high priest had to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifices on that mercy seat of the ark and on the ground in front of the ark. And the law was in the ark. The tables of the law were in the ark, inside and that sprinkling of blood on top of the mercy seat on top of the ark symbolized the covering of the sins against the law with blood. Only blood could take away sins. But it was clear that because those sacrifices had to be brought every time again, year by year, they could never really make those people who were worshiping there in the temple perfect. Could never make them perfect. In order for Israel to live in a relationship with God, there had to be that constant stream of blood in the temple. Year after year, the sprinkling of the blood of animals on the mercy seat of the ark. And outside of that, also on the, the great altar in the inner court of the temple. Sacrifice after sacrifice, day by day, year by year. But all that animal blood that flowed there could never really remove the guilt of Israel's sins. In fact, all of those sacrifices were just shadows, really. Shadows and depictions, you could say, of something greater. Something real. When you see a shadow, you just see the outline. You don't see the real person. Well, in the same way, the Old Testament sacrifices were just the shadow of the real, the great real sacrifice which was promised and which would take away the sins of the people once and for all. What was clear, though, was that that blood had to flow. Atonement for sins could come only by means of blood, by means of the taking of life. Someone had to give his life. And you see in all that blood that flowed, that it was God's will for the people to think of their sins and of the need for forgiveness. God really didn't desire the blood of bulls and goats, as the quote from Psalm 40 shows. He, he desired repentance from sins. So those sacrifices all pointed to a sacrifice that would satisfy for sins once and for all time. The thing is, congregation, Israel could see, clearly see in, that, in all that temple worship, they could clearly see God's will. They showed that God willed to bring about full atonement for his people. Without that full atonement for sins, no relationship with him was possible. And he wanted that relationship. They needed to be holy. He, those people needed to be perfected to be with him. 
And the fact that those sacrifices continued year after year showed clearly they could never be made perfect. Those people could never be made perfect that way with animal blood. And you could never become perfect by keeping the law of sacrifices, no matter how many animals were sacrificed. No, God showed in those sacrifices and ceremonies it was his will and his plan to free his people from their sins and to make them perfect by means of one single, wonderful, great sacrifice. And the sprinkling of baptism, as we saw it here this afternoon, is the sign and seal of that one great sacrifice that, it was, that was made for Liam and for all of us. And we hope to remember that same sacrifice next Sunday with the Lord's Supper celebration here. God's Son came in our flesh and blood in order to fulfill the will of his Father. He was ready to give himself totally in order to do the will of his Father. And that's why that quote from Psalm 40, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And what great love Jesus had for his Father in heaven, if you think about it. He did the will of God from the manger to the tomb. And that's why it says in Hebrews 10, verse 9, that Jesus took away the first that he might establish the second that means he did away with those Old Testament sacrifices and offerings and established his doings of God's will, even to the cross as the salvation of his people. By that will of God, then, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, it says in verse 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And that will of God is manifested then in the gracious sending of his son for our salvation. And that by that will of God, the father, we have been sanctified. We have been set apart for God to be his own children. We are in principle perfected to be God's children. In love, he sent his son in your flesh for you perfectly fulfilled the will of his father, even when it, when it meant the cross for him. Father, if possible, he prayed, let this cup pass by me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And it was the father's will that his son give himself completely over to hell and death in order that he might be holy and per that we might be holy and perfect in his sight. So that in the first place, we see in the, the second place, the triune God brings us to perfection. God the Son then accomplishes that. Boys and girls, brothers and sisters, the work of God's Son for us is of incalculable worth. And you see that in verses 11 to 14 of Hebrews 10. That whole sacrificial worship of Israel culminated in that one sacrifice of the man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. That's what God makes very clear at the death of Jesus when the veil of the temple rips in two from top, from, from top to bottom. That, that was obviously God's doing, and he shows with that that the atonement for sins has taken place once and for all. The annual sacrifices and sprinkling with blood on the Day of Atonement and, and all those other blood sacrifices no longer had to take place. The shadow worship was completely finished because the one real sacrifice to which all of those shadows pointed has been there, has na is now there. The truly precious and atoning blood has flowed. The priestly service in the temple is no longer needed because the sacrifices carried out there in the temple can't take away sins anyway. They can only be done, that can only be done by Jesus, God's Son. And see, it was God the Father's will to make salvation possible for us, to adopt us as his children and heirs. It had to come from him. He, he initiated that. Jesus is God's Son, and he accomplished the will of God the Father, 
And his work isn't completely over with his suffering and death on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended and is seated at the right hand of God. And there he intercedes for us. In heaven, he entered the real holy of holies. Not the shadow, but the real holy of holies. And there, as our eternal high priest, he intercedes for us on the basis of his once for all sacrifice. But that that shows that that one sacrifice was sufficient, abundantly sufficient for the sins of God's people, abundantly. And in that regard, Jesus being seated in heaven has special significance too. In the Old Testament, the priests were never allowed to sit down as they were doing their work. They had to remain standing. The work was never done, in other words. That showed that their work was never done. It always had to continue there in the temple. But Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. His work of atonement was finished, had been accomplished. The old covenant was fulfilled by him. Now there was the new covenant in his blood. But even though Christ's atoning work is accomplished, the kingdom of God isn't finished yet. Citizens need to be brought in. Enemies need to be defeated. All Christ's enemies will ultimately have to acknowledge his authority, and they will be made his footstool, it says in Hebrews 10, verse 13. They will be made a footstool for his feet. That's quoting Psalm 110. In the end, his enemies will bow before him, and he'll put their, his, neck, his, his foot on their necks as the kings did in ancient times when, when they conquered enemies. For those who reject Jesus' work of atonement, their rejection will ultimately mean total humiliating defeat and condemnation. But that finished work of atonement is a great relief and joy to all who believe in the Lord Jesus. Verse 14 puts it wonderfully. Puts it wonderfully there. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He has perfected for all time. That's what those who are now being sanctified may believe. Those who aren't perfect here by a long shot yet, we'll talk about that yet, but who wish they were. They are those, by the way, who are encouraged in our form for Lord's Supper to take part in the Lord's Supper. You don't have to be perfect, it says there, but you, you need to wish you were. Those who are heartily sorry for their shortcomings and desire to fight against their unbelief and to live according to all God's commandments, to quote the form, they know their lives aren't perfect, but they may be fully assured that no sin or weakness which still remains in them against their will can prevent them from being received by God in grace and being made worthy partakers of the heavenly food and drink. So the form is talking about those who are being sanctified, those who know their sins and sinfulness, but who wish they could serve him better. God already in Christ, in that one sacrifice of Christ, regards them as perfect in Christ, justified in him. Do you recognize yourself as one of those? As a true believer, you're in reality already perfected in God's sight, in Christ. You know you're still quite imperfect here in your thoughts, your words and deeds. It's a struggle. But through embracing Christ in faith, you may know at the same time that you acknowledge your imperfection, that you're actually perfected and justified in God's sight. And that means that you don't need to add a thing to his great sacrifice for you. Christ's perfect life completely covers your imperfect and broken life. Christ has taken care of all your sins with his blood. No other offerings are needed. No other deeds are needed. Your being made right with God is already finished for you. The word assures you of that. And the sacrament. We come to the last part of the sermon. 
the triune God brings us to perfection. God, the Spirit, finishes that. So we've paid attention to the will of God the Father to make us perfect, to make perfect people, and the work of God the Son in bringing us to perfection by his one perfect sacrifice. And now we look at what the passage of Hebrews 10 says about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Notice, by the way, that all three persons of the Trinity clearly come to the fore in, in that part of Hebrews, in those first 18 verses of Hebrews 10. And that shows you can't really read the Bible and understand it without the confession of the Holy Trinity. Well, in the verses 15 to 18, the word of the Holy Spirit comes to the fore. It says in verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. So it speaks to us what he knows for certain. Hebrews mentions the speaking of the Spirit more often. In chapter 3, 7, Psalm 95 is quoted. And that quotation is introduced like this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, notice the Holy Spirit is spoken of as a person in the quotes from the Bible that David and others wrote. That's the, he inspired the Holy Word. And then he speaks in verses 15 to 18 of, of Hebrews 10, and it's a quotation then from Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah 33, uh, 31. That quotation is about the new covenant that God promises to make with his people. He will put his laws, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. That's the new covenant. Everyone big and small will know him. The spirit not only speaks these words, he's the one who puts the laws into the hearts of his redeemed people. The son of God fully accomplishes his work for all with his once and for all sacrifice for our sins. But the Holy Spirit is the one who finishes that work in us to make us perfect. Our sanctification. The debt of our sins was perfectly forgiven in Christ crucified. But we are then also more and more freed from the bondage of sin. The bondage of our remaining sins and sinfulness in this life by the Holy Spirit. And that's the distinctive feature of the new covenant after the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church. That sanctifying work of the Spirit so that the law of God is no longer written on those stone tablets in the Ark of the Covenant, but in our hearts. And then when that happens, we want to more and more offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, acceptable to God. So when the Spirit puts God's law in our hearts, writes it in our minds, we become motivated to grow in our love toward God and our neighbor. We want to grow, not just stay where we are. We want to grow, become holy as God is holy. We could say the desire for perfection grows in us. And that's what the Apostle Paul talks about in Philippians 3. The passage we also read, he states there, verses 12 to 14, not, he says there, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Now, that's Paul, who already is perfected in Christ as far as his justification before God, but he's not perfect as far as his sanctification. So he says, not that I have already obtained this perfect sanctification, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, the, the apostle knows that in Christ he is perfect with respect to the forgiveness of all his sins and therefore will be with God in the future forever. That's what he means with the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. And that means to be with God forever. But that doesn't mean that while he waits for that up, upward call, 
He's now going to sit back with folded hands. He's not perfect as far as obedient to God's will is concerned. No, as he says, verse 12, he's not already perfect in that regard. But as a person who is perfectly washed with the blood of Christ, he now longs for also his heart to be completely washed with the spirit of Christ. Like a runner in a race, he then exerts himself to reach the finish and to receive the prize of the upward call of God in Christ, to be with God in perfection. He works with the Spirit toward the perfect life which is laid away for him in heaven with Christ already. And see, that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in every believer. Through the, the gospel of salvation, as it's also signified and sealed in the sacraments, the Spirit writes God's law in your hearts and your minds so that you strain to live according to it now. And you don't look behind, you don't wait, you don't stop. You want to make progress in holiness. And until when we leave this life, we obtain that prize of spotless perfection with God obtained for us in Christ. So fully forgiven in Christ now, fully renewed by his spirit then. Congregation, do you see how thankful, how joyful the confession of one God and three persons is for believers? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together to make you perfect. What a comfort that is, in, especially in perfectionistic times like today. The triune God guarantees, in fact, perfection in our baptism, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This triune God has willed, has accomplished, and will certainly perfect and make flawless for all times those who love him and rely on him. Amen.